This is Andy Perua for Boxing News. I'm joined by esteemed American writer Dan Raphael over Zoom. Dan, always a pleasure. How are you? I'm doing good, Andy. Always a pleasure to talk to you. I'm glad to hear it. Um, obviously, we've got a, a lot of boxing topics to cover and you're a busy man, so we'll get straight into it. Uh, the first one I'm interested to get your thoughts on is obviously this weekend we see the KSI and Tommy Fury fight. Now, obviously, it's divided opinion. Um, I think it's safe to say that the boxing fraternity, as it were, um, are not necessarily on board with it, but it's certainly gained a lot of eyes, a lot of coverage this week. What's been your thoughts on everything to do with KSI Fury, the way that both men and the teams and the entire event has been handled, and, yeah, just, just your take on everything? I mean, it's a circus. It's a sideshow. Uh, you could derisively call it a freak show. Look, it's uh, there's certainly an appetite from some fans for that type of event, if you will. Not my cup of tea. I don't have I don't have no problem if you like it, but uh, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not buying the pay per view particularly at the. I mean I've paid big prices for pay per views like the eighty five dollars that they ask for in America for some of the bigger fights, but those are significant, legitimate world championship fights. I get it. You know if you're watching Errol Spence and Terence Crawford or Canelo Alvarez against Charlo, but they want fifty five bucks in America for KSI and Tommy Fury, and uh, I'm just not gonna buy that. I I don't even have that much interest in it. It's uh. Again, if you if it's your thing, by all means. But uh, I'll put it like this: if you're interested and you're not able to watch it, you don't want to be following my social media for uh, my thoughts and, and the and the scoring and the results because I'm not going to be watching it live. Um, well, one thing that we know boxing fans are, are very interested by uh, our pay per view numbers. Though we've seen obviously ESPN jump on board with some form of deal with the zone as well. Uh, how do you expect to see this sell um, stateside? Well, like a lot of pay per views, in terms of in the American numbers no matter how good the fight is, it's it's a hard sell from the standpoint that the timing is not the best for our time zones. So right off the bat, and this, this is the same, for example, when, when Tyson Fury fought uh, Dillian White, for example, and it was a pay-per-view in America, because they come on uh, in the late afternoon Eastern time and even earlier uh, in the Western time zones, California, Las Vegas, you know, places like that, uh, it's just not conducive to the most buys. So I'm sure we'll do some numbers just based on uh, the hype that it's gotten. Uh, I would expect it would do much better in uh, the UK, given that KSI and Fury are both British and it's got a lot more hype there. Uh, it hasn't gotten as much hype here, I don't think. So it, I have no, uh, there's no real way to predict what it would do just because of the fact that uh, it's not appealing to the typical boxing pay-per-view audience. And then you combine it with the fact that just in terms of the timing, it is not in the best time uh, for those of us that watch pay-per-view boxing just because of the time zones. Um, Dan, just sticking with the theme of broadcasters, uh, we haven't had it officially confirmed, but it seems to be more likely now that Showtime will be leaving the sport with the exception of, you know, a pay-per-view platform for any specific shows. Just want to get kind of your understanding of where things currently uh, sit, uh, are sitting with them and where PBC are currently looking in terms of potential new broadcast partners. We know that Amazon Prime deal has been spoken about. Well, first of all, as you said, they have not made any formal announcement. That is what everybody's been talking about. Uh, when I was in Las Vegas uh, recently for the Canelo versus Charlo fight, and which was a Showtime pay-per-view event, obviously that was in in uh, in terms of the the conversation during the week of the fight. That was almost more of a conversation among the boxing folks out there than the actual fight, because as I've said before, Canelo and Charlo was a one-night stand. Showtime boxing has been a 37 year situation. So, you know, the fight was obviously a big deal, but the fact that the broadcaster Showtime after all these decades and so many mega events, and really in terms of in the United States, one of the, the cornerstones of the sport for so long, the prospect of them no longer being involved, you know, is, is a, a big deal. And it's, uh, you know, very disappointing to a lot of people. Um, you know, as I joked around uh, half joking, half serious, I still haven't recovered from the exit of HBO from boxing. And now to think that the deal with Showtime, leaving the sport on top of that, uh, it's just a whole new world. So, uh, again, it hasn't been confirmed, but that's certainly the way it looks. Uh, you know, it's not that they're not wanting to do boxing. It's that their parent company, Paramount, is making lots of changes with their uh, all their various networks and, and, and things that they work with uh, because of their streaming propositions, the fact that they've, um, you know, found – uh, that the revenue was not what they want it to be. They, these are just anecdotal examples. They were the owner of the, the big bookseller, the big book publisher, Simon & Schuster. They just sold that. They also own uh, the cable network BET. That is now on the market to be sold. 
um, Showtime is being integrated into their Paramount Plus uh, streaming service. So, you know, I actually saw an advertisement on Paramount for the upcoming Tim Zoo fight this weekend where it wasn't even branded Showtime. It just had the fight and the Paramount Plus logo on it. So, you know, it's pretty obvious what's happening. Now, whether they stay and do some pay-per-views next year, which would supposed to have been the final year of their PBC agreement, you know, I think that's probably what will happen. As far as PBC will end up in terms of their regular shows, uh, anybody that would underestimate the ability of Al Heyman, uh, you know, the the boss of PBC to find a deal, uh, doesn't know Al Heyman. I mean, he's a resourceful person. He's a smart person. He's been around for decades in the entertainment industry, boxing, obviously, since the early 2000s. Uh, I would never underestimate his ability to land something. The words are that he's talking with Amazon Prime for a possible American deal. Um, I don't have that confirmed. It makes sense since they're now throwing themselves into various sports programming. They do NFL uh, and that sort of thing. So if they're looking to build out a sports uh, uh, department, if you will, boxing would seemingly fit into that uh, overall portfolio. But again, we're still waiting for clear answers. I mean, when I was in Las Vegas, as I mentioned, I talked to Showtime people and they they wouldn't come out and say it. Steve Espinosa wouldn't come out and say it. But, uh, you know, you can tell that there's a lot of folks at Showtime that are uh, and they're worried, like a lot of people are going to lose their jobs. And, and I know for a fact that there are people that are involved at Showtime who have been calling other people involved in boxing, looking for other jobs. So, uh, you know, their, uh, rank and file, if you will, are, are of the belief that they're no longer to be doing boxing, at least at the more regular level. So they're looking for gigs. I can't blame them. And it's, uh, you know, it's a heartbreaking thing. If they go out of boxing, the tradition and the history of what Showtime has done for these decades is just at the top of the game. I mean, they may not be at the same level of the, of the, of the fan recognition and the, and the overall love of an HBO, but they're not that far behind. And they have done the biggest pay-per-view events and the, some of the biggest fights of all time, tons of Mayweather fights, Canelo, uh, Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield, Julio Cesar Chavez. I mean, you can go right on down the line and they've been involved in these fights. I mean, just this year alone, some of the biggest fights that we've seen in the whole sport with Ryan Garcia against Tank Davis and, Obviously, Canelo and Charlo and Errol Spence and Terrence Crawford, they're, they're doing these, this David Benavides andre fight. They did Benavides, Caleb Plant. They just had, and that's just this year, they've had a monstrous history in the sport. And if that goes away, uh, you know, it's a sad day. Uh, and I'm not sure I'm going to recover. Like, I still haven't recovered from HBO's exit. Uh, I don't think you'll be the only one who'll be struggling with that one, Dan. Um, just sticking with kind of where PBC may go, if it is confirmed to be true with Showtime's exit, Um do you think there's any possibility or have you heard any noises of them having any form of conversations with the zone? Obviously they've started to build their platform more and more over recent years. We've already got American partners with golden boy match room USA. Do you think that could be a possibility or, but do you think that's a bit out of reach? I mean, I guess you never say never. Uh, I have not heard that, but you know, the zone has worked with, as you mentioned, they have deals with match room and with golden boy. And they have been picking up some shows here and there from some other promoters more regularly from Europe and some of the promoters here that are sort of one-offs. Like they've done, they're, they're doing a couple of shows with DeBella Entertainment, for example, Lou DeBella's company. Not not big shows, but like his, uh, you know, he runs a good club show in New York on a regular basis that they're doing like the Jamel Herring return fight uh, coming up. They've done one uh, before that. But, uh, you know, if you're going to if you're gonna throw in with PBC, I think they're going to have to be more than a one-off. Uh, but I, I mean, I guess it's a possibility. I mean, but I have not heard that. So I, I would I would kind of be slightly surprising, uh, but it depends on what they would offer and what Al's interested to, to to offer them and what he would expect back in return. I mean, on that um, PBC front, uh, there's a lot of talk about what's going to be next for kind of Javante Davis and Tank and on terms of bringing Showtime into it. Um, Tank and Pitbull Cruise, is there truth to that? Will we be seeing that early next year? Well, that's the fight that has sort of been uh sitting out there for a while where i've always suspected that that was going to be the rematch that it made a lot of sense for a lot of different reasons when tank has his next fight probably early next year uh i thought maybe at one point that maybe it would be the end of this year i mean obviously he did a short term uh you know in jail but he has had two fights this year so it's not going to be this year obviously uh look uh, pitbull cruz was in a position where he could have fought against uh, shakur stevenson for the vacant wbc lightweight title that was turned down you don't just turn that down just to turn it down i'm sure that they did so knowing that there is the prospect of this uh, fight with him and and uh, Davis. And look, the first time they fought, it was a fight that was a number one. It was a good fight. It did pretty good business. A lot of people thought that that Pitbull Cruz deserved the victory. And so it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever if that's the rematch. Now, whether Showtime does it or some other entity does it, that still remains to be seen. Whether he even gets the fight, you know, a lot of this is just speculation at the moment.
But uh, I, I have heard from people around it that that the that the likely scenario is that in the early part of next year, when Tank does return, it will be a rematch against Pitbull Cruz. Obviously, they can change their mind at any moment. That's that's typically what PBC has done. They 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 they, they make their decisions, and uh, things can change on a, on a whim. Frankly, one of the men that Tank defeated uh, this year, and Ryan Garcia, has been those reports started surface about a potential fight with Tiafimo Lopez. Next year, can you give me any further details as to what you know about how those conversations between Bob Arum and Oscar De La Hoya went? Well, I can only tell you that they definitely are talking about doing not just that fight, but uh, just other fights. They they both have a uh, you know stable of fighters that can match up with one another, and for a long time that was the worst combination of promotion uh, deals you could make because they were on such the outs for such a long time that you know, we all called it the Cold War. They just could not see eye to eye in anything. But more recently. Uh, they've smoothed that over. And uh, while they're not going to go out there and do every single fight together, there have been a number of occasions where they have a, a cordial relationship. Now they've done plenty of matchups where it's maybe mandatory fights. There's been some fights where top rank has sent guys to fight on their show and vice versa. For example, coming up uh, later in October, you have Alexis Rocha, the welterweight is going to fight Giovanni Santiana in the zone main event that golden boy is putting on Santiana is with uh, top rank. There was no purse bid. There was no, it's not a title fight. They just decided to make the match and thought that, uh, you know, it made sense for what uh, Golden Boy was offering, that they would get their guy a good opportunity. And so they're going to go do that fight on the zone. And I'm sure there'll be times when uh, other Golden Boy fighters in the in the future come and fight on top rank cards because top rank makes the appropriate offer. So I think they can definitely do the business together in terms of making the level of a fight of a of a, uh, of a Ryan Garcia challenging Tiafimo Lopez for, for that type of title. I mean, that's... That's a big time fight. And so that's going to take some doing. Obviously, they fight on separate networks. Uh, one is on DAZN, one is on ESPN. But obviously, if you're a boxing fan and you were ticking off, like, what are the top fights you'd be interested to see? I would think certainly a tank, uh, I mean, uh, rather a, a Ryan Garcia against Tiafim Lopez would be somewhere on that list. Obviously, look, Tiafim was not fighting the rest of this year. He's coming off the win where he got the title from Josh Taylor. Uh, Ryan Garcia has got to take care of his business coming up. He has a, a, a fight that I don't think is a walkover that he has against, uh, you know, coming up in Texas uh, in December. So we'll have to see what happens. But that would be phenomenal if those guys could get together and make that kind of fight. Uh, it would be great for the boxers. It would be great for the fans. And it would be great for the whole business. I'm just kind of sticking with uh, the lower weight stand. Obviously, Hany Perigre is on the approach now, December 9th. It's a fight which everybody's very much so looking forward to. What's the general reception been like stateside, though? And how, what are you envisaging come December 9th in San Francisco? Well, what I, I mean, my under, what, what I feel like is sort of the same that I see when I read the comments that I get from people either on the, uh, my Substack newsletter comments or people that, uh, you know, post things back to me on social media. Good matchup. Oh, disappointed it's yet another pay-per-view. I mean, because we've been inundated with pay-per-views. All the pay-per-view fights that PBC just did. We had Haney and Lomachenko pay-per-view. We got this fight pay-per-view. Uh, you know, Tyson Fury against Nagano was pay-per-view. If you're into it, the KSI, uh, uh, Tommy Fury fights a pay-per-view. Uh, we've had Jake Paul pay-per-views. I mean, there's just a shitload of pay-per-view. And for a lot of people, they buy their subscription to a thing like the zone for this level fight. They're not buying it for Jack Catterall against Jorge Linares. They're not buying it for Matchroom's next gen cards. Again, there's nothing wrong with those fights, but that's not why you're buying the subscription. You're buying it to get the premium kind of fights. And they have been lacking, frankly, uh, in terms of the zone. Now, people will say, well, what about these other outfits? I mean, yeah, it's just because you're complaining about one doesn't mean, you know, you're saying the other ones are okay. I think a lot of people were pushing back on Benavides against Andre being on pay-per-view. Um, you know, at least in the case of top rank, they don't do that many pay-per-views. They've had, I think when they do the Fury fight, they'll have done like two pay-per-views this year, the Tyson Fury, Nagano, and they did Haney against Lomachenko on pay-per-view, but they don't overload the schedule. Uh, it feels like that that having Haney and Progre, a very good matchup, but does it rise to the level where I should now have to go and pay another X number of dollars? They haven't even announced the pay-per-view price. I can't imagine it's anything less than 60 bucks. Um, but as far as the fight goes, it's a really good fight. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, the number one lightweight going up to take on uh, probably at worst like the number three, maybe two with junior welterweight. They've been talking a lot of shit with each other, um, and it, it you know they've both been talking a big game. They both bring different things to the table. If there's only one negative about it, it's just the fact that uh, you know Regis Progre, and I think by his own admission, has just looked so terrible in his recent fight. Uh, last couple of fights has not been uh, you know at his best. I don't think. Uh, the last one particular when he when he uh, defended against uh, Zaria. Um, 
but a good matchup. And, uh, you know, that's a pay-per-view I will support. I will buy it. Uh, I will hold my nose and buy it because I don't like the fact that it's a pay-per-view, but definitely a good fight. Here in Ghana, there's a fight there which you just mentioned. Um, Dan, again, just want to get your thoughts on that on that fight, please. Uh, obviously, we know Tyson are going to be a heavy favourite. General consensus is the fight plays out however Tyson wants it to play out. I would agree with that. I think there's now even more of a fan, of a of a good chance that he'll try to end it early because it was one thing when this was the fight and there was nothing afterwards. And a lot of folks thought, well, you know, he was just looking to fight this fight to grab the money and wasn't interested in real fights because he said so. He said he didn't care about being undisputed. He didn't care about fighting Alexander Usyk or some of the other bigger names in the heavyweight division. And they just wanted to do these types of fights. He talked about, I'll fight uh, Nagano, and then I want to fight Nagano in a cage, you know, in a rematch under MMA rules, or I want to fight John Jones in either a boxing match or in a cage or whatever. And those are not the kinds of fights that, you want to see the heavyweight champion involved in. You want to see him take on, you know, the other top heavyweights. So uh, I think the acceptance of his fight with Naganu was like my perspective on it originally was like, I'm okay with it. I don't like it, but I understand it because if you can go make crazy money to fight a guy that's never really boxed, I mean, how can you say no to basically getting free money uh, and, and an event that people will be interested in? But I actually think it's more palatable now because there's more state at stake because he's already signed for the Usyk fight. So it, it lends itself where, you know, there's still danger. I mean, no matter what the odds are when you're in the ring with another guy, that's like six foot, whatever, big, strong, 240, 50 pound guy. And he's throwing punches at your head. Anything can happen. So now with the Usyk fight on the table signed and uh, looking to try to get that fight in the ring, potentially by the end of this year, or maybe in the you know January of next year, you know, it now becomes interesting. How quickly can Tyson Fury get rid of Naganu? Uh, or make sure even if it goes rounds that he doesn't get injured and doesn't put that big, humongous, legit, undisputed championship fight in jeopardy because that's a huge deal. Uh, and so I think there's a little more intrigue now in the in the Ganu fight just because of what comes next. Just on what comes next in terms of Fury Usyk, obviously the public are still somewhat dubious as to whether or not we see that. The December 23rd date has been touted. We know Matchroom have mentioned that as a potential date for the Eubank Jr. and Ben fight, depending on how Connor obviously fares with UCAD and the board and trying to get his license over here, whether it happens abroad. There's all of those factors to consider. But um, is it, 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 to your knowledge, 100% going to be happening next, Fury Usyk, that is? Well, if Fury is the winner against Naganu, uh, that is the fight that is next. That's that's not like some kind of secret thing. That's what they announced. That's what that's what the folks at Riyadh Seasons and what Matchroom Boxing, uh, uh, not Matchroom Boxing, but the uh, uh, Frank Lawrence folks and what Top Rank, they've all announced that that's the next fight. So now whether it can happen on December 23rd, I mean, again, it depends on what happens. I mean, in the fight on, on October 28th, I mean, you know, even if Tyson Fury scores a, a big knockout and gets out of there early, you never know if there's some kind of ache and pain or some kind of tweak of an injury or something along those lines. So you have to kind of be fluid with it. Uh, and frankly, December 23rd is such a weird date because, you know, so much of the, of the, of the fans and the, and the folks that they're looking to purchase the pay-per-view, they're not looking to buy uh, an expensive pay-per-view two days before Christmas. They're visiting family. They're having, uh, they're traveling to visit relatives. They're spending money on, on holiday gifts and things along those lines. And I think a boxing pay-per-view, is probably at the last thing on their list. So that just, that's a really strange uh, date. So I'd be a little surprised if it took place that date. As far as the possibility of a conflict between the undisputed title fight between Usyk and uh, and Fury, oh, and perhaps the same date that Matchroom has mentioned about the fight between Connor Ben and Eubank, um, I'm, I'm pretty confident in, in my experience of covering professional boxing that these potential conflicts usually have a way of sorting themselves out. Uh, I'd be rather surprised if you saw two fights of that magnitude on the same date, because I just don't think the broadcasters uh, are going to allow that. And, and they're just not going to do it. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're uh, the zone and you're competing against what would pr probably be a fight on BT uh, or TNT box office, now they call it uh, with the, with the theory fight, you're not going to let your guys do that. Why would you compete with that when you've got, and why would you do that to the audience? Just going to piss everybody off. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that you're not going to see, those two fights compete against each other. And frankly, I'd be a little surprised if they tried to do the the uh the Connor Ben and Eubank fight on the on the, the 23rd also. I, it's possible, I guess, but again, why would you do that? You're leaving money on the table if you're going on on a Christmas Saturday. It just makes no sense to anybody. Nobody's paying attention to boxing on Christmas week.
I was going to my next question, just sticking with Ben and Eubank. What's your understanding of where things currently sit with that fight? Um, it seems to be that it's slightly edging more towards Abu Dhabi now. Um, but you never know, obviously, where things stand with the board. You can, do you have any knowledge on that front? I don't think about that is that it, in terms of where they take where they take the fight, if it in fact gets gets done, as you mentioned, it's a lot of it's going to depend on if Connor Ben is licensed to fight in England uh, or you know anywhere in the UK. It would just be I would say this: it's, it, if the fight does in fact get done. It would be very unfortunate for all the great fans in the UK for that fight to not play, take place in the UK. I mean, that's obvious that I'm not like uh, uh, making a headline there. That just seems awfully stupid to have that fight uh, take place there. I mean, I understand that that certain fights that there's a huge amount of money at, at stake where they can put up a big site fee. But I, I have a hard time thinking that if you go and do a fight like that at a, at a big, big place, that you can't bring in, you know, huge amounts of money also. And the pay-per-view numbers would be off the charts in the UK, I would think, for that fight, uh, given all the hype and everything that happened with the drug testing and everything. There's so much anticipation for that fight that it will still be a blockbuster. Um, I would just hope that for the sake of the fans that live there, that they'd be able to travel and go see it in their home country, not have to get on an airplane and travel uh, thousands of miles to Abu Dhabi to see the fight, if that's, in fact, where they try to put the fight. Is Joshua Walder off, Dan? <laughs> Was it ever on? It's a very good I mean, question. Yeah, he, I don't think he was ever on, but there was hope. There was always hope, but it seems to be that he's um, certainly fallen by the wayside now. That's just one of those fights where uh, it feels like we're going to end up just thinking about that years from now, like what what might have been. And look, I'll say this. I mean, as interested as I, I would be, certainly if they were to fight, you know, in the next fight or, you know, next few months or whatever, it's never going to be what it should have been, you know, what, three or four years ago when they were both uh, holding titles it would have been for the undisputed championship because Anthony Joshua had the three belts and and uh, and Wilder had the WBC title and they were both undefeated and it they didn't happen they they went back and forth a number of times you know blame whoever you want they both take uh, some of the blame in my book it never happened then and it, it you can never recapture that moment it should have been the biggest fight in the world it should have been the two top heavyweights the two undefeated champions one British fighter one American fighter fighting for all the marbles. Uh, in a humongous mega fight and and they didn't make the match and you kind of get what you deserve when you don't make the fight when it makes sense. Benavides and Drydover, that is a fight that we're getting a fight which does seem to make a lot of sense. Just get your thoughts on that um, again. What the a press conference was like the other day? Yeah, I mean, look, if, if Canelo Alvarez uh, is the undisputed uh, super middleweight champion, I will tell you that David Benavides is the undisputed number one contender and because Canelo had other things going on with the Charlo fight, uh, but now they're they're all with PBC, so I still think that's a possibility. It wasn't like Benavides was going to sit around. Andre went with PBC, had his first fight with them earlier this year in January, and uh, and won that fight pretty handily. And so if you're not fighting Canelo, um, the next best thing is to fight each other and to really continue to press the issue that you are the guy that Canelo should fight. So I think there's a lot at stake here. Number one, uh, both these guys are undefeated. They both have been champions. Uh, they're both uh, contrasting styles. They're both, both really good uh, at what they do best. I mean, uh, Benavides with a, with a tremendous amount of pressure it puts on opponents and, uh, you know, good power and a good chin. You got Andre with a, just a massive boxing pedigree from his amateur days and a great boxer. Southpaw, you know, underrated, in my opinion. Uh, maybe not a lot of knockouts, but a ton of knockdowns and really knows how to box. He's, you know, a consummate boxer. This is really uh, the first time in, his career, he's getting a chance to step up against a marquee opponent, and I'm glad he's getting the opportunity. I wish it had been a little earlier in his career, not when he's 35 years old, uh, but I would never underestimate his boxing skills. So it does shape up like a very interesting fight, and I would think that the winner certainly is going to have a mandate, at least from the public, to be the next opponent for Canelo. We'll see if Canelo answers the call. I mean, Canelo's always fought the top guys. He's you know he's not really ducked fighters. I don't expect him to start now, but I do hope that when he comes to make his match in May, when he intends to next get into the ring, that uh, he will look to the winner of this fight. And so that adds some stakes to it. It's not like, uh, you know, yeah, it's for the WBC's interim title that Benavides holds. But the reality is this is like an, an eliminator to be the to, to be the mandated guy by the public to get a match against Canelo Alvarez. And that that makes it interesting. All right, Dan, it's a pleasure as always to catch up with you. I know you've got something to take care of very shortly, so I'm going to leave you to shoot off and get ready to do so. Thanks for speaking to me, and I'll hopefully see you soon. I look forward to it, Andy. Thanks a lot.